Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your speaker, Chris McCann. If you'd like more information or to hear more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now, with your evening Bible study, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible study in the book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 7 of Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to be reading Revelation 12, verses 4 and 5. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God into his throne. I'll stop reading there. Now, um, we've seen that the woman is representative of the body of believers and that the man-child, the child that she delivers, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Satan is this great red dragon that, with the seven heads and ten horns that stood before the woman when she was ready to be delivered in order to devour her child. And this worked out in the world through Herod wanting to slay the child. And he he did have children two years and under killed in the area where the Lord Jesus was born. And so we, we can see how Satan does work in the affairs of men. It, it's interesting uh, in the book of Job, when we read of Satan Uh, presenting himself to the Lord and accusing Job of of having a hedge about him and, and so forth. And then God gives Satan leave to afflict Job, to to do certain things to Job, but to spare his life. And the next thing we we discover as we're reading the book of Job is that Job's wife tells him to curse God and die. It's almost exactly what Satan wanted him to say. And yet it's coming through the mouth of Job's wife. Job's wife, who also had suffered a great deal with the loss of their possessions and the loss especially of her children. And so she was weakened very much in her mind and and able to be manipulated by the devil. And she expresses the devil's desire, curse God and die. Well, Herod expressed the devil's desire to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ, to kill the child that was born. And that's how Satan works in the world. He's able to stir up people, especially, um, well, no, if they are unsaved and They're in his kingdom. They're um, fair game for him to use in this kind of way. And that's what happened with Herod. All right, we're going to move into verse 5 now of Revelation 12. And it says, And she brought forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. She, the woman, and remember, this woman was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. She's no ordinary woman. It's not talking about Mary, even though Mary is a woman who God used to bring forth Christ to give him a human body and and a human nature. Yet Mary is not the one in view. It is speaking of the body of believers, the elect that lived on the Old Testament side of the cross And the Lord Jesus, in a sense, in the figure that God is using, came forth from them. And so, and she brought forth a man-child. Now, this is interesting. This language of man-child is interesting. Because literally, in the Greek, it reads, she brought forth a male son. The word son is here that's found 
uh, many times in the New Testament and translated as son. She brought forth a male son. And the word son by itself would indicate a male. That's right, isn't it? You have maybe children and you have a son or you have a daughter. And if you have a son, then you have a male child. And that's just how it is. You can't have a son who's a daughter. It, it must be a male. So it's curious that God uses these two words together. It's not all that common that he does this. The word is translated as male in, in a few places. Like, for instance, um, from the beginning, they were male and female. In Matthew 19, when the Lord is explaining that marriage is between a man and a woman, God created the male and female. And, and that's the word used here. She brought forth a male son. And obviously, a son is a male. So why the double emphasis? What is God pointing to by this? Well, let's just look at one place in the New Testament where the word male here that's found in Revelation 12, 5 is also used in Luke chapter 2. In Luke 2, beginning in verse 21, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written, in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So there's the word, every male that openeth the womb, that is the firstborn, shall be considered or called holy to the Lord. Now we, we find similar language to Luke 2 in Exodus 13. In Exodus chapter 13, it says, beginning in verse 1, And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And then further down in Exodus chapter 13, in verse 11, I'm going to read several verses, beginning in verse 11. And it shall be when Jehovah shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto Jehovah all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast. The males shall be Jehovah's, and every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this that thou shalt say unto him? By strength of hand Jehovah brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that Jehovah slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to Jehovah all that openeth the matrix being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. I think um, Exodus 13, 15 and this statement that I sacrifice to Jehovah all that openeth the matrix being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem, is the answer as to why God speaks of a male son in Revelation 12, 5. Yes, Jesus is the son of man as he was born into the world, born of a virgin. He had a human nature, but he is also the male sacrifice offered up to God. And so by using these two words, God is um, pointing to both things. He, he is that son of man, and since he was a man, 
and and he possessed the human nature he could die for men and and pay for their sins but he's also a male as god used male animals often in israel's sacrificial uh, system to typify the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I think that's the reason. Um, I, I can't think of any other reason. There, there seems to be no point otherwise, but by saying th- that she brought forth a man-child or a male son, both words. If you look up the word male, it leads us to Exodus 13 and to the sacrifice of, of every firstborn male animal and the word son leads us to the son of god the son of man the messiah who also uh, will be this sacrifice or was this sacrifice as he really was the lamb of god and and there is where the male reference comes in jesus is typified as the lamb of god slain from the foundation of the world all right continuing in verse 5 And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And this is the third time already in the book of Revelation that we've seen this phrase used, the rod of iron. Back in Revelation chapter 2, it was stated, beginning in verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power, over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And it was also said in Revelation chapter 7, concerning the great multitude, in verse 15 of Revelation 7, Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. I'm I'm sorry, this is the reference to, uh, the word feed is actually the word uh, rule, and um, I I, uh, went out of place. Uh, This isn't where the whole phrase is found, that he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, that That's actually in Revelation chapter 19. It, it, so it's found three times in Revelation. This is the second time, excuse me, this is the second time the complete phrase is found, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Revelation 2, here in Revelation 12, and then again in Revelation chapter 19. And it's a reference to what is said back in the Psalms in Psalm 2. So let's go back there in Psalm 2, beginning in verse 5. It says, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree Jehovah has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen, that's the nations, for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And this is referring to the wrath of God being poured out during Judgment Day. And and so the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son, in verse 7 of Psalm 2, uh, where it said, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. That's actually taking us back to the point of the foundation of the world when, when Christ died and rose again to be declared the Son of God. And that qualifies him to be the judge, the uh, one who comes in judgment at the end of the world to 
rule with a rod of iron. And, and notice what happens. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And that reminds us of what the Lord says in Romans chapter 9. In Romans 9, beginning in verse 21, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? So the unsaved people of the world are created by God. God's the potter. They're pottery. Every human being is like a vessel of pottery. Some to honor those that God saves, the rest to dishonor. And those to dishonor, the potter, the creator, will destroy. They're fitted for destruction. And that's why it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. The rod will be used to break the pottery, to dash it in pieces, as it says in Psalm 2, verse 9, like a potter's vessel. And, that, and that's where Revelation 19 comes in. In Revelation chapter 19, and, and this chapter is detailing uh, in just tremendous ways, the day of judgment. And, and we read, for instance, in Revelation 19, in verse 13, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Now, uh, let me just say before continuing that the sharp sword coming out of Christ's mouth represents the word of God. The, the Bible or the word of God is likened to a two-edged sword. So out of his mouth, and of course, the word of God, the Bible, comes out of the mouth of God. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it, the sharp sword or the word of God, he should smite the nations, that is, the word of God will be used to smite the nations, and the word of God will be used to do what it says next, then he shall rule them with a rod of iron. So the word of God, the Bible, the, this holy book, is going to be used by the Lord Jesus Christ as a means of judgment. Of course, he's not going to literally pick up the Bible and smite people with it, but it's the information that comes forth from the Bible. It's the truth that is revealed by God to his people, who in turn share it with others, that will do the smiting of the nations. And it's also that word that will result in the Lord Jesus ruling them with a rod of iron. And notice, uh, before we go back to the phrase, ruling with a rod of iron, the last part of verse 15 of Revelation chapter 19 says, And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, we shouldn't miss that. that that's a very important statement. In that context, in the setting of Judgment Day, uh, remember there, there's another chapter in Revelation, chapter 14, that speaks of Jesus putting forth the sickle, harvesting the earth in the Day of Judgment. And at the end of Revelation 14, in uh, verses 19 and 20, it says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Now, without the city means without that, uh, that uh, city of New Jerusalem, without 
uh, outside of the those that Christ has saved because the city is comprised only of elect and and God's electors a uh, great multitude the majority of them are still alive and living on the earth in the time of judgment but they're part of the holy city because they have been saved and therefore translated into the kingdom of God into his city they have citizenship there and the wine press of the wrath of God is trodden without the city. In the world, everyone who's not saved is without that holy city, the New Jerusalem. And, and therefore, they are being punished. While the, the child of God, who is saved and a part of the city, could be their neighbor. He could live right next door to them. And, and all around are unsaved, being punished because they're without the city. But the true believer who lives amongst them in the world is not being punished. He's not being trodden underfoot in the winepress of God's wrath because he's a part of that city through salvation. And so the Lord Jesus is the one treading or trotting the winepress and the blood comes out by the space of 1,600 furlongs, which relates in all probability to 1,600 days of judgment. Now, that's important because in Revelation 19:15 we have Christ who is smiting the nations with his word, the Bible, and simultaneously ruling them with a rod of iron while simultaneously treading the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And that's an indicator that this will continue. It will go on throughout the 1600-day period. That Jesus will smite the nations uh, throughout this whole time duration, and he will rule them with a rod of iron also throughout the entire period of Judgment Day, this prolonged day of judgment. And again, what does it mean that he will rule them with a rod of iron? Now, have you ever thought about this? How is it possible for Jesus to be ruling the nations with a rod of iron? And Revelation 19.15 makes the time clear and definite. It's Judgment Day. And yet, he is ruling them with a rod of iron. There, there is a, an idea of, of governing, of overseeing, especially when we realize that the word rule is a Greek word. First of all, it's Strong's 4165. I would pronounce it poimeno, and it's from Strong's 4166. It's derived from that word which is translated as poi men. It's very closely related to poi men. And poi men is translated as shepherd or pastor. Poi men is the word found, for instance, in John 10, verse 11, twice, where it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The word shepherd is poi men. And that means when this word poimeno, 4165, is translated as feed, we can see that's exactly what it means. That is, um, in Revelation 19.15 and in our verse in Revelation 12 and Revelation 2 and the verse I went to in Revelation 7, the, this word translated as rule them with a rod of iron, Strong's 4165 is also translated as feed in 1 Peter 5 and verse 2. It says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not of filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Feed the flock. Now, how would you feed the flock? With the word of God. In Acts 20, in verse 28, it says, 
uh, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. And again, you feed the church during the church age and, and always the eternal church of God's elect through the word of God. And in John 21, in John 21, in verse 16, it says, He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. This is all the same Greek word that's translated as rule. Rule them with a rod of iron. We could very properly understand it to mean feed them with a rod of iron. And when we go back to Revelation 19, we see that the Lord Jesus is called the Word of God in verse 13. And then in verse 15, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. And, and the sharp sword identifies with the word of God. Hebrews 4.12, the word is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. That with it he should smite the nations. We can see that clearly. God's word pronouncing judgment, pronouncing the shutting of the door of heaven, the end of his salvation plan that... Judgment has begun upon the world that smites the nations, it smites the inhabitants of the earth, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall feed them with a rod of iron. And even the word rod itself relates to the word of God, and, and that can be shown. So Christ will use the Bible to smite the nations. And he will use the Bible to, uh, at the same time, feed his people. And when he does so, it will be like ruling the unsaved with a rod of iron. It's amazing because that's exactly what's happening as God opens up this information. It is spiritual food for the child of God. It is nourishment to our soul. But at the same time, it's a condemnation. It's a grievous thing for anyone that's unsaved. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies. You can hear these studies Monday through Friday over Pal Talk, Skype, eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over your phone. For more information or to hear other studies, visit www.ebiblefellowship.com. Until our next study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.